during this very special time. Uh, the title is Sponge City and Nature Based Solutions, uh, inspired by ancient wisdom. So, this lecture, I will, after this lecture, I will follow the other ones. The other ones is my experience, uh, my route based in my rural villages, how these ideas come from. Uh, so, that's basically the, uh, uh, what is a sponge city, what is nature based solution, what, what I have done, and how, why come to into uh, become the major part of my practice. So we have these challenges, multiple challenges, climate change, flood, drought, uh, and pollutions and habitat loss. And today we have the COVID-19. COVID uh, over 80% of Chinese cities are suffering air pollution actually. Uh, it's a uh, uh so many problems so many problems but actually they are all interconnected it's all related when you have flood you certainly will have a drought because china is uh, uh the majority of chinese cities actually is under the influence of monsoon climate so whenever you have the flood you drain away water and it's then months later you get a drought so so these all problems are related, uh, but today climate change becomes the the most interested and most uh, uh, important uh, uh, challenges, and certainly we can deal with climate change based on my experience. I mean adaptation certainly, and mitigation. Uh, so uh, when you solve one problem, you actually can solve the other problems. Uh, all related. When I look at the, 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 the solutions uh, today we have, uh, I find that all these solutions actually uh, it, are not, not wise enough compared to what we had as hundreds and thousands of years ago. We should get inspired from those wisdoms dealing with water dealing with drought, dealing with the flood. Now this knowledge uh, come from the survival experience. Uh, so these two images just uh, show you how the East and West, uh, uh, Venice, of course, you know, uh, the other side is, is the Chinese uh, Pearl River Delta area. Uh, this pond and dike system, it's a spongy system, you know. In this marsh, the Chinese, use very simple cut and fill uh, technique, create a very productive landscape and habitable and the most beautiful. So that's uh, that just show you how we already have this wisdom to deal with flood, dealing with water. But such kind of wisdom are usually buried on the layers of modern industrial technologies. Now these are the solutions we use to deal with flood, drought, drainage, pollution, and, and yet they are very single mandate, very single goal mandate. You will have flood, you build a wall, a concrete wall, and you want to drain away all the, the water in order to keep the city from being uh, <coughs> urban inundation. And then you build all this uh, uh, sewage treatment to clean up the water. And actually the water are during back 20 years ago, this are still being used as a fertilizers for, for farm, for, 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 for rice paddy. Now become, now considered to be a pollutant. Uh, so this, this industrial uh, technology-based uh, solution are really fairly single-minded solution. And uh, I believe they cannot solve the problem. Uh, and not sustainable either. Uh, so the alternative to the green infrastructure is the green infrastructure, or I call it the ecological infrastructure that is nature-based and can provide multiple ecosystem services, production, regulating, 
as an environment, life supporting spiritual and cultural services. Now, this is what we try to do to solve the problem, uh, 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 flood, drought, pollution, climate uh, uh, change, and all these problems. We think that uh, this green infrastructure can function as alternative, or at least can function as a, a, as a, a, a implement to, uh, to the gray infrastructure. Three key challenges. Now, for this, uh, in, in order to build this green infrastructure. Uh, the first challenge is how to plan, how to, how to develop this, the, the system. Uh, because land is, is limited, the resources are limited. How can you create an, a, 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 a system, uh, draw the line between nature and culture and let nature function, let nature uh, provide the services? The second challenge is certainly the design and engineering. Uh, how to design these nature-based solutions so that they can function uh, efficiently. Because the nature-based solutions are, 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 are working, but they usually are not so efficient, not so direct, uh, and there's no standard for that. So this is another challenge, uh, which means how can we design uh, engineering uh, these natural solutions? The third challenge is uh, policy. Because uh, we are the, the whole society now, it's it's a structure based on the industrial civilization, industrial technology, uh, and also policies like flood control policies, like urban construction policies, uh, even urban stormwater management policies are uh, all depend on the, the the mentality or the thinking, the intellectual infrastructure based on industrial civilization. So how can we uh, change this policy so that the nature-based solution can, uh, can be implemented, uh, can uh, be used in such an urban situation? So it is a revolution. It is a change, a big change. Uh, so, and, and, uh, so we have, the three, we have the three levels of actions, the planning, a planning a green infrastructure, a ecological infrastructure across a scale, a design and a campaign for the policies, policy change. So there's a planning, the action level one is a planning infrastructure across a scale. This is just show you the models as the, the typical uh, infrastructure we have now trying to do across a scale. So this is the urban scale. So the green infrastructure removes concrete to, to turn gray into green, to create a sponge in the middle of the city and also across uh, all this community, to the community. So, so from, from uh, the community, from the house, all the way to the street and the river system, uh, we need an infrastructure, a green infrastructure to deal with the urban problem. Uh, the methodology is uh, to, to identifying the ecological security patterns, which are based on the analyze of ecological process, such as uh, the flow of water, the movement of animals. Uh, so this is based on ecological analyze and develop this, this potential model of, of the ecological process and identify what is the most, what is the most efficient pattern, the most efficient landscape pattern to secure the process, the natural process, the ecological process. So this is a, this is a which I actually based, a, uh, which is the, the main uh, research uh, interest during my uh, doctoral research. Uh, so, and across, and since then, when I back to China, I apply this uh, method to the national scale, to the regional scale, and to the urban and community scale to identify this ecological security pattern 
which means if we can draw the line uh, uh, to define the ecological security pattern, we can virtually uh, control or virtually manage a most efficient green infrastructure to deal with to deal with all the to provide allow to provide all these ecosystem services uh, across a scale from national, regional to urban and community scale. Now the second level uh, action is design and engineering. Create nature-based uh, engineering models. And these are all inspired by ancient wisdom. Uh, for example, these are just three very typical, three very simple uh, models. You can see uh, use very simple tools, cut and fill to create terraces, Imagine it's a monsoon climate, you know, you in, in Indonesia, Malaysia, China, uh, India, uh, Bangladesh, we, we are facing the same problem of monsoon climate. How can you uh, catch water during the, during the rainy season and use the water uh, year round? Uh, so we cultivating, cultivating rice, uh, and so you have to change the slope. Uh, create terraces. The terraces is a very ancient uh, uh, technique to, to adapt to the monsoon climate, to catch water and grow rice up in the mountain. Uh, even the slope is very steep, you will see this technique works. And it's really, really very, uh, very monsoon uh, region, monsoon climate. You, you will not see this in uh, in, in Europe, uh, because it is in the monsoon climate, we have to regulate water. The second is the pond system. In China, we have a very ancient wisdom of using pond to regulate water. Uh, back 2000 years ago, the Chinese already know that 20% of land should be given to pond. Whenever you cultivate uh, four hectares of of land, you need to give one hectare of land for pond. Now that's very, very Chinese because that's an adaptation to climate. So you will see today when you fly over uh, China in rural side, in rural country, in, 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 in countryside uh, landscape, you will see uh, it, it is pond. You know, it's a, a pond, it's a porous landscape. It's a pond in the villages, in the field, in the mountain. Uh, so this pond is a very efficient solution. And the third model is pond and dike. We have the river delta areas, the Pearl River Delta, the Yangtze River Delta. You will see all this delta uh, back 2000, 3000 years ago. These are marsh, just the marshland. Uh, but this pond and dike system makes this land become habitable, productive, uh, and beautiful. Uh, that's a solution to deal with flood, deal with uh, too much water. So eventually you'll create a pond for fishing, for fish, and there's a dike for, for mulberry, for, for fruits, for vegetable and the grains. Now this just to show you how the ancient, is, uh, ancient wisdom uh, helped the monsoon uh, region, monsoon climate region to adapt to the, to the climate and make the landscape productive, habitable, and beautiful. So this is a, this is a, a, a inspiration. So inspired by this kind of farming wisdom, a replicable model has been developed to solve the multiple, uh, the multiple uh, urban uh, water issues. Uh, and because they are so simple, so economically, so inexpensive, so they can be applied massively, uh, widespread across the scales. So we, we, we are able to design engineering based on this traditional wisdom and we test that. Uh, so we test this model and then regularize those models and become replicable and to, to apply to this uh, larger scale urban transformation. Uh, 
ecological restoration, uh, removes the gray infrastructure and transforms the gray into green uh, uh, and recover eco ecological uh, uh, system. Now, and we, we certainly have all this technique been patented and develops this idea about, you know, uh, called a sponge city. Uh, all this join, regularize those uh, uh, modules and can be applied at larger scale. So for over, over 20 years, we have been testing uh, using this uh, uh, technique in over uh, 500 projects in more than 200 cities. Uh, now I want just to give you some examples how this nature-based solution, which are inspired by the ancient wisdom, works to transform gray into green. So first uh, is make friends with water. Now this, this is a normal issue. In, we'll see, you will see uh, in Chinese uh, southeast uh, uh, cities, uh, this will be uh, uh, concrete, usually people build flood wall. Uh, this is very industrial, you know, this is very industrial technique. And, but, but we, we for, for, for many years, for decades, we use this technique and we didn't solve this problem. So build, we, but we keep building, you know, we keep building and we use so much concrete. Uh, China use uh, about 60% of concrete, of cement of the whole world, you know, every year in the past, 30, 40 years, 60%. So imagine how much concrete we have dumped into the rivers, into uh, the delta area, try to build a flood wall. Uh, but this is not necessary. So it's related to climate change. It's related to, to uh, uh, carbon, carbon emission. Uh, if we can cut this kind of uh, carbon emission, we can certainly save the world much, much uh, 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 better. 60% uh, uh, cement can be saved if we based on this kind of nature-based solution. So we analyze, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we based on the ecological security pattern to do the planning first. So we analyze the process of flood process, hydrological process when we when we doing this, we will, you will find that flood actually uh, uh, is limited. It doesn't need so much. It doesn't need so much land. Uh, we calculate. We calculate the whole nation uh, in China. We only need uh, about one percent of land for urban uh, for for flood for flood. So so water only need one percent. So why we have to dump so much concrete to, to protect the, the land from being flooded? So, and, and build all these singular cross sections for the whole river system. Uh, so that doesn't make sense. So we remove this kind of concrete channel and recover it, uh, use cut and fill. Now these are kind of pond dike system and terracing the, the river bank and recovering the, uh, the nature uh, waterways. And this is only take one year. And not, not so much, no, not so expensive compared to the conventional industrial uh, solution. And introduce uh, resilient uh, uh, native grass. This is an example. So it's the same river, but, uh, but uh, it take, uh, so the first section was done uh, about 20 years ago. And 10 years later, the government come back again to say that we want to do the whole river. We want to de-channelize the whole river and use this nature-based solution. Now that's today you can see the so concrete. We didn't take much of the land, the same, actually the same area, uh, the same uh, uh, wide of, of, of the concrete, uh, it's the same way as, as before the concrete channel now become a totally green, resilient. So we de-channel the river, remove the concrete, you can see here, and uh, create this uh, inner river. And this used to be a, a 50 year flood wall. So we lower this dike to 20 year flood. 
so that the flood will come over and uh, uh, come into the inner river. Now, the reason to do that is that the river become more accessible for people to use, and certainly green, and be able to remove the nutrient along uh, inside the water to remove the nutrient, take off uh, some phosphorus, uh, and, the, and the fish come back. This is another example. This is in Jinghua city in my own hometown. Uh, this is a very typical concrete flood wall. Uh, very dangerous, uh, certainly uh, lifeless. Uh, only, the only keep the lower uh, stretch more uh, 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 vulnerable for flood. So, so, so the solution is terracing the riverbank. It become uh, terraces, you will have you have this kind of riverbank flood wall. So this used to be the flood wall, so it removes concrete and terracing the bank. This will be five year flood, 20, 10 year flood, 20 year flood, and 50 year flood. So this will become a multi a functional uh, river corridor. Uh, allow people to use it because the monsoon flood only need one week or two week or sometime only one day. Uh, Ninety percent of the time will be can be used by people. Uh, so during the flood season, you can see as uh, the whole river corridor will can be flooded, and once it when it dry dry out. This will become a park, a beautiful park. Now the water will deposit as uh, a fertilizer, the silt, uh, become more uh, favorite for trees to grow in June during the dry season. Uh, so this this a new need a new way of designing the city, make the city more resilient. Uh, uh, it's challenging the design technique, design the idea how to to become to make the city become flood resilient. And we tested, we test this. Uh, we find out that the, the uh, maximum daily peak reduction rate can reach 50% to 63%, which means as a flood risk, ER3 can be lowered if we use a nature-based solution. Now imagine, how much can be changed if nature-based solution is to be implemented nationwide? Uh, this, what, this, this image you see, you have seen here, uh, is is just happening in China. Uh, people still dump all the concrete cements in the river, channelize the river, and also imagine it's going to happen in other parts of the world, in Bangladesh, in India in Indonesia, as they still think the channelizing river building flood wall is the only solution to keep the city safe. Now, that's what we find about how to make the city more safe, use nature-based solution. Now, this is about regional flood. What about urban inundation? So we call a sponge city use a sponge city to, to absorb, to retain water, to clean the water, and uh, recharge the aquifer. This is an example in Sanya, in Hainan Island. It's a typical monsoon city in, in the tropical uh, uh, China. So first, this is the first official demonstrative project of sponge city in China and the ecological restoration movement in China. Sanya uh, was like that. Uh, flood and drought after the rainy season and the pollution uh, because all when during the flood, particularly during the flood season, uh, the sewage treatment uh, will dump the sewage into the river so the whole water system get uh, heavily polluted. Uh, so actually level one is a, is a planning to look at where can be flooded the following the, 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 the urban, the rainwater, we will see uh, the blue area will be the, the area that is needed for managing stormwater. Uh, if we 
can keep this area green or can keep this area porous, uh, 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 permeable, and, uh, uh, and let, uh, let it be taken by water. We can virtually avoid urban inundation, avoid urban, uh, urban flood. So that's the planning level. Then following this pattern, following this mass plan, we find some key point here. Now these are ecopuncture. <laughs> this is a point where you should, you should uh, do some real project to have a, as a demonstration and as a fairly efficient project. So uh, this is a uh, urban, urban ecopuncture point. So we create a green sponge uh, called a Dong An Wetland, right in the middle of the city, uh, and uh, using this ancient wisdom. It's a, virtually a revival of this pond and dike system. This is in Pearl River Delta, you know, how beautiful and how simple it is, but it, it works so well. So we we inspired by this technique and create a pond deck system, cut and fill. Uh, you can see create islands right in the middle of the of the wetland. Uh, didn't move, didn't remove any of the dirt. Uh, right on site, create a sponge system. I take one year. Now this is just uh, uh, after after a couple months. So it's the process of creating the sponge right in the middle of the city. Uh, this was before, and this is a year later, uh, two years later, like that, you know? Uh, so the whole area become a sponge. Yeah, this area. Uh, and as the land become much safer. You can see this was before uh, the project and this is after. Uh, so it solves the urban inundation problem. A fairly simple uh, ancient wisdom. Uh, but certainly we upgrade those, we upgrade those use so that it can be applied to this uh, modern uh, engineering uh, 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 machinery. And this project uh, is in Sanya Mangrove Park. Uh, Sanya, the same city, is another part, another project, part of this ecological restoration movement. And this project is about climate resilient design. Uh, again, use the nature-based solution. This is what people, uh, this was before the site. You can see people build a heavy infrastructure, try to keep the city from being flooded, being urban, uh, I mean, being uh, flooded from uh, the storm, the ocean storm. It's, uh, it's, it's very, a uh, very heavy construction site. So here you can see the flood wall, a flood wall. This uh, the site uh, is a is a, a get a debris from the urban construction. Uh, that's the project. So the flood come from fresh water from above and urban. I, I mean, and the sea water surge from the ocean. Uh, it's a it's a it's a place where the fresh water and the salt water meet. Our solution is to create a, a ecotom where the fresh water and the salt water keep meet here, you can see, but we create this called interfigure, uh, 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 interlock figure, uh, which means we can avoid the, the surge from the ocean. But at, at the same time, the salt water, the ocean, wave can come into this uh, 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 area, in interlocked area. And the, the fresh, the fresh, the fresh flush come from above and they also can avoid this area. So we create a, a resilient, a spongy, resilient uh, coastline. Uh, and because of, of the uh, uh, water, the salt and the fresh water meet. So we create a habitat for mangrove. That's uh, a mangrove habitat. And uh, so this is a, this you can see during the wave, high wave, high tide, low tide. Yeah, uh, there's a low tide and a high tide. Uh, so mangrove, we introduce mangrove. 
as a favorite habitat for a mangrove. This was a site that people tried to build a concrete wall. We say, no, we, we, use, uh, we use a mangrove instead of concrete. Uh, this today, uh, that you can compare just one, uh, this I, I, I will see that just one year later, just one year later, you will see how the landscape has been transformed and the concrete wall become a, a green, resilient uh, uh, mangrove. This was a site. See the flood wall. The flood wall, this is a site. Now that's a construction process. Uh, open the land, let the water come in. And uh, that's, that's today. Yeah, that's today. That's an interlocking uh, mangrove habitat for nature to come back. Uh, and certainly, this is a pavilion. This will be used for people. The other side is a, is a nature and the culture. So this side for people, this side will be for birds, for, for uh, nature. It's, a, it's, it's islands, you know. It's, that was a site that's uh, built today. And so it's not only create a habitat for a mangrove, but also a, a, a beautiful public space for people and increase uh, land value for the city in the middle of the Sanya city. That's this all the pavilion design this is designed to, to, to be uh, 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 climate uh, resilient also uh, during the, during the a storm it become a shelter and certainly become pavilion uh, and urban uh, urban you know uh, installation a beautiful site uh, that's a, some details of the design uh, i don't want to go to so detail but I just show you how an and a resilient coastline can be created uh, based on natural uh, nature based on nature uh, so third case is to about is about the nature-based solution to deal with uh, urban water pollution. 75% uh, 70, of surface water in China is contaminated. Uh, they are basically uh, fertilizers. You know, instead of pollutant, they was used by farmers back 20, 30 years ago. Now this is uh, China, the, the other imagery is in Bangladesh. You will see uh, this is a global issue. Nation, uh, internationally or global wise, 85% of sewage water untreated running into the water. Uh, if you want to clean up this kind of sewage, you need 3.8% uh, of energy, total energy global wise. Uh, so that's expensive uh, and it's unaffordable for developing country right now, uh, almost unaffordable because you have to build all the facilities, uh, what treatment facilities. So the alternative solution is green solution, the nature-based solution. Create concentrated wetland, a concentrated, concentrated wetland to dealing with pollutant. Now this is uh, 10 years ago, we do this test uh, you see this example in Shanghai uh, Expo site. Uh, heavily polluted. We build this section uh, designed uh, as a, a terrace, designed the terraces to clean the water. So that's the process, basically how to turn the, the, the contaminated water into clean water. Use one wetland system, a wetland system. It's a cascade wall, a natural based again, uh, you create uh, oxygen in the water, the cascade wall uh, for aeration and terraces. These terraces uh, for the water to submerge, to allow the plant to, to the root to take off, to, to remove the nutrient. And so uh, this is just a couple of months later, you will see how uh, lush the vegetation is. Now that's the terracing, the land, that's after a couple, a couple months later. And after one mile of uh, wetland, uh, create construct wetland, you will you'll, you'll see the crystal clean water come out uh, from five grade 
to third grade. Uh, the third grade water is uh, swimmable, uh, become clean. Uh, now these are, are some of the tests. Uh, for, so we keep testing, we keep uh, measuring how it functions. Uh, it's so well, it's so well. Uh, 85% of nutrients can be removed after this one mile running. Uh, daily, it can produce uh, 800, 800 cubic meter of clean water just by a hectare of constructed wetland, constructed wetland. So we replicate this model. We apply this method across the uh, nation. We build so many, we have, we have many projects. Uh, a successful project. Uh, this is in Hainan Island, again, in uh, Haiko. Uh, these images were taken just uh, before the project. Uh, for 20 years, the city government tried to clean up the water, clean up the river, but uh, uh, it, didn't, it didn't happen. It didn't solve the problem uh, because they, they use the fairly single mandated solution like build a wall, drain, uh, and the dredge the river bank, as uh, so a dredge the river bed. And it, so it's, it, we need a holistic nature-based solution. Uh, and by the way, this uh, flood was, was built just uh, five years ago. You know, it's, it's just, they it just built it and it didn't solve the problem. So we say, we, we want to remove this concrete. We want to remove the gray concrete and the turns is green, turns is into green. Uh, uh, river, uh, come back to the natural river system. And beyond that, and then before that, uh, uh, beyond that, we build this terracing uh, bank, terraced bank to catch the urban runoff, to clean the, the even the uh, sewage runoff. Because as there's, there's a, a village, you know, you see the urban village here, they didn't treat water well, so some urban runoff, sewage runoff. So we create terraces, catch the sewage. You look at the, the blue, the blue shelter, the blue uh, box here. It's a pre, a pre -treat, water pre-treatment facility. So the, 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 the smell, the, the bowel bacteria will be treated, be killed at this fairly simple facility. And then the sewage, the pre primary treated sewage will run into this wetland and it will be cleansed by the natural system, uh, by the natural wetland. Now this is how, how it works, the process. And it, it, how it is, look at how it works. So after this terracing, after this uh, uh, six, eight, eight terraces, so we basically create this uh, clean water, uh, clean water, it becomes swimmable. Uh, that's, a that's a test for the for the uh, for the uh, 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 for the uh, result. So looking forward, if we can apply this kind of technique, nature-based technique, to solve the seventy-five percent of surface water contaminated nationwide, and uh, eighty-five percent of sewage water untreated global-wise, how much? You know, energy can be saved. How? So that's that's what I can I can imagine for the future. Like this is Taihu Lake, huge lake. You know, thousands of miles, uh, square miles. Uh, it's all polluted like that. It's basically fertilizer. So my proposal will be to create this construct wildland system to clean and recycle the nutrients. So this is my proposal for the agricultural system, restructuring the agricultural uh, system so that the, the nutrient can be catched. And we test that. We test this, this is in Suzhou, in near Taihu, Taihu Lake. So we created a this very small project and we test that if this system works. And we tested that it is working very well. Let's see how the cleansing process happened. I look at the sea, even the ocean, uh, it's the same problem also. The Bohai Sea in China is uh, contaminated, heavily contaminated. It becomes dead sea, a uh, dead sea. We are, we are talking about 700 square 
kilometer in size. Uh, I mean, not not seven seven hundred thousand square kilometer in size. We're talking about such scales, such kind of scales problem. So my proposal will be to catch this surface runoff to clean up by the natural system and eventually clean up the water, the whole ocean. And we test this, we test this out also, as in uh, uh, China's Qinghuangdao city. So we create, we create a spongy coast or coastline to catch the urban runoff, to catch the, all this fertilizer. Uh, that's, that's the result. And to absorb all the nutrient possible, all the nutrient. And uh, now that's still a pilot project, but uh, it's successful. And we hope that uh, if the whole national coastline area can be, you know, be, be, be to transform into sponge land, uh, we can virtually solve the problem. Uh, and, and the third, the fourth problem, and the problem is the pollution of the soil. Uh, this is a project in Tianjin. The land is heavily polluted, salty, uh, alkaline soil. And so this, how can it solve the problem? 60% of Chinese urban land is contaminated like that because of industrial, uh, we call it brownfield, we call it brownfield. Now the solution again is to nature to use nature as a solution. Nature-based solution: collect stormwater, create a porous sponge on the ground, and to catch the stormwater and uh, uh, to to dissolve the the pH of of the soil and create habitat for a native biodiversity, and let nature take over. The nature process take over to remove the, the contamination uh, and eventually introduce native habitat right in the middle of the city. And certainly we test that, we show uh, how this works. You can see the native biodiversity uh, it dramatically increased. You see the drop of uh, the pH value of the soil. You see the improvement of uh, 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 of the, the, the soil. Uh, it is fairly dramatic. And, and certainly action level three will be the, to change the, the policy. Now in the past 20 years, I, I keep writing letters to mayors, the leaders, the ministers, even to president uh, to, promote, to promote this idea uh, because uh, the president is a, is, a, is a most powerful landscape architect. The president is the most powerful designer and architect. So as soon as uh, the president have the idea of ecological thinking, ecological civilization idea, we, we will see the most successful transformation of the national landscape. So those so letters to the leaders of China, uh, I have this uh, just uh, 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 published in, in New York a couple, uh, I mean, two years ago uh, by Michael Sorkin, actually. Michael Sorkin, uh, 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 in memoration of him, he, he, he just passed away uh, because of COVID-19. So uh, this, this is a collection of my letters to the leader of China. I just give you one example how this, uh, my proposal to Prime Minister uh, back 2006 to Premier Wen, Wen Jiabao he, how he accept the idea of ecological security pattern. And this idea now become a national agenda to, to protect the national ecological system. So far, four regulations have been, has been issued for the protection of Chinese ecological uh, system and saving God as a na national ecological security pattern. Uh, so to conclude, more than ever, it is clear that we need a paradigm, paradigm shift in planning and designing our city to adapt to the changing uh, uh, climate and solve the multiple urban ecological issues. Such a shift calls for the rethinking of a way uh, we build our cities based on industrial technologies. 
to say that, let's to say that we, you know, uh, China and uh, certainly Singapore and uh, uh, all the all the uh, uh, countries in the uh, monsoon climate region actually uh, are borrowing the Western urban models uh, from where Europe. Uh, we develop the city based on the great infrastructure. Uh, and, and we forget we have five years, 5,000, I mean, 5,000 years uh, experience of adapting the monsoon climate. And now we find that those great infrastructure developed in the European countries or even in America uh, didn't, uh, didn't ad adapt to the the monsoon climate here. Uh, it's so simple. That's the reason is so simple. Uh, the European countries have very, very quiet, very mild climate. And when we apply those pipe system in, in the monsoon climate, it, it failed, it failed. So that's why I calls for the revival of the ancient wisdom of survival. Now these are nature-based solutions. Uh, not only just transform the landscape, but also uh, as a way to uh, develop a new model, a new alternative uh, to build a resilient city. Uh, now this is not only for the developing country for the uh, uh, monsoon regions, but also this can be, uh, uh, as, can be used as a model for, for other countries in Europe, in America, because now the whole globe is suffering climate change. Uh, the mild climate is over. We have very dramatic radical climate coming. Uh, this, this means we need a more uh, resilient urban uh, infrastructure. So uh, now we have, we have time, we have, this is my first lecture. Huh? Uh, so I, after, the, after this lecture, I will give you some time and then I come to my second lecture is uh, uh, why I believe so, why, uh, where I come this, all this knowledge. Uh. Welcome back uh, everyone. And we will now continue with the second part of this afternoon's presentation. Uh, can everyone please uh, switch off your cameras and make sure you are on mute uh, so you don't disturb the proceeding. All right. Okay, great. Fang Jen, I hand over to you. Okay. Yeah, just one minute. Just one minute. Close your eyes. Hold. Yeah, just a minute. Okay, no problem. My root. Yeah. Okay, can you see it? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, so is is uh, the last lecture is about my approach to design, and this this lecture will be about my root, my root, where all these uh, ideas and nature based solution come from. Uh, so my journey to heal the planet. Uh, this was a lecture I give uh, to when I was a couple, uh, two months ago about on the Jeffrey Jellico Award uh, presentation. Uh, so I would like to begin by talking a bit about my childhood, which has ultimately had a profound influence on the way I have come to think about my work. Uh, I was born to a peasant family in Dongyu village in southeast China's uh, Zhejiang province uh, is a, a very productive province, uh, very heavily density, uh, density, density very high, high density populated. Uh, the village is located where the White Sand Creek and the Wujiang River meet. The White Sand Creek is a very poetic uh, 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 creek, beautiful creek. Now this image you can see uh, about 30 years ago, uh, I took 
about my, uh, no, I mean, 40 years ago. That's long time ago. Uh, this, is, this is my rural village landscape. Rice paddy, uh, stalks of uh, rice. The villages, uh, uh, the past to the villages. That's a white sand creek, you know, so beautiful uh, in the morning. And uh, I, I saw the creek during the summer. I swim, I mean, I, mean, I swim in the creek during the summer uh, and caught big fish when the monsoon season come. You know, this monsoon season is not, not a big deal. We, we, we follow the pattern, the rhythm of nature, uh, catch fish during the, during the flood actually, the fish come to your field, come to your uh, uh, threshold, actually. I took care of a buffalo when I was a kid. Uh, you can only, uh, the, the, the buffalo can only eat the grass along the waterways and between paddy fields. So this is, uh, but uh, it, it disappeared. This is an image I found in another place, which is in Anhui province. Uh, uh, that's a, so similar to, to what I experienced during my own childhood. And there was seven ponds in the village. Now, again, this is, this, this is not my village, but uh, uh, it's just like my village. A patch of sacred forest and two big camphor trees in front of the village, under which many legendary stories about my ancestors were told. Now this is kind of landscape I have experienced during my childhood. Big camphor trees in front of the village. The land was extremely productive. We planted three crops throughout the year, including canola, wheat, buckwheat, rice, sugarcane, peanut, sweet potatoes, everything. So everything, so productive. Again, this is not my village because it's disappeared, already disappeared. Uh, urbanized sugarcane like that you will feel the space uh, created by this uh, sugarcane I, I uh, hide and uh, fauna hide uh, play in this field uh, this kind of landscape it's really touching my field my 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 heart uh, rice harvesting lotus and the land was and land and water was uh, were uh, precious, but the uh, weather could be unpredictable. So we had to design and manage our farm field wisely, following nature's rhythm, nature's cycle, and waste nothing, and adapting in order to make a living. Uh, so subtle, you know, the landform, the terrain uh, is so subtle that you have to manage the water subtly and use the gravity instead of palm, instead of energy, just following the nature's pattern, uh, the colors, the changes, the seasons. Uh, you can see the same landscape can have such subtle change uh, around the season. So we worshiped, we worship as a God earth, what a God, and you uh, the great, you great, you the great, Da Yu, you the great the legendary king who knew how to manage water and plan the land. We also worshiped ancestors who had the wisdom of adapting to nature and cultivating the land. As a Yu the Great, or Yu Da Yu, he was the first elected king of China back 3000 years ago. Because of his skill, his, his He's a planner, he's an architect, he's a landscape architect. He know how to plan the water, to manage water and plan the city. So he was selected. He was elected by the community, by the, uh, the people, the first king of China. In all likelihood, I will have followed, the, uh, followed my father's footsteps who told me how to cultivate the land, manage water, and, pro and to be a, uh, become a productive farmer. Yeah, uh, that's my family. Uh, you can see my brother, my brother-in-law, my father, mother, 
uh, uh, one day in summer in 1978, Mr. Zhou Zhangchao, an army veteran who came to teach in my village, caught up me, uh, caught up with me on my way back home, riding the buffalo, and told me that Deng Xiaoping had reversed the Cultural Revolution era policy, and I was able to go to school again. You know, because I was born in the landlord family, peasant landlord family, which, which was the enemy at that time, the national enemy. So I began studying hard to catch up the school. I, 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 I have dropped the school because my bad family is a landlord family. So I have to start hard and catch up with all my classmates. Uh, in 1980, after working in the Camille, so Camille, I worked for Camille for 17 years. I mean, living with Camille, I began working as, uh, began like six years old. So at least I worked as a farmer for seven, I mean, for 10 years old, for 10 years before I was uh, able to leave, leave the village, go to Beijing for school. And I passed the national examination, national uh, university examination. And uh, so lucky uh, I become only uh, uh, one out of 300 plus students in our Lulo High School. I was the only one being able to go to the university at that time. To go to university so hard at that time. Uh, then, in Beijing Forestry University, I was accepted as a, a student, as one of 30 students for the entire nation. And I imagine only 30 students to become a landscape architect. As that time uh, was called gardening, a landscape gardening, uh, which had been canceled for 10 years during the Cultural Revolution. So I was lucky to have the best landscape gardening professor in the nation as my mentors. Leaving the dirty earth of the countryside and making beautiful gardens in the city was certainly a dream for me and my parents. Suzhou Garden, this is a Suzhou Garden, rockeries, ornamental flowers and pavilions and these things. But when I finished college and was starting my career in teaching and making beautiful gardens for the city, I returned home to find out that my village had been destroyed. The sacred forest and the, the camphor trees had been cut and sold off. The creek, the white sand creek itself had become a gravel pit, a gravel quarry, and the fish disappeared. So I began to ask myself, was I meant to be doing something more? What about my village and my fellow villagers? What about the land beyond the garden walls and beyond the city walls? So I sought new inspirations and I was accepted at Harvard Graduate School of Design working with Carl Stanitz, uh, who, was, uh, who was the first PhD student of uh, Kevin Lynch. Uh, he, now he, he was uh, the planner or landscape planner uh, at that time teaching at uh, JSD, along with landscape ecologist, uh, Richard Foreman and GIS computer uh, expert, Irvin, Stephen Irvin. I would often encounter Ian McHawk, who was teaching a studio at JSD at that time, and Michael von Falkenberg, also a professor in practice, and Peter Rowe uh, and many others uh, in the hallway. So these are my mentors at uh, JSD. The concepts of landscape and urban ecology, people-oriented urbanism, landscape perception and, and revolutionary anthropology, landscape and architectural phenomenology, and, and many more, enlightened the left side of my brain. Uh, this was the hot topic. Uh, this was a hot topic at that time. Design works by contemporary masters inspired of the right side of my brain, 
um, Peter Walker, Orlean, Michael von Falkenberg, Richard Hack, Maya Lin, Marsha Swartz, Peter Lutz, to me. Uh, those are the uh, stars during my school years. It was a time of great debate within academia, and I found myself fascinated by the tension between design with the nature versus design as political, a political procedure, ecology versus art. So I was haunted by two questions, which has, uh, which have subsequently driven my entire career. The first question is conversation, uh, conservation versus development, a special planning based on idea uh, of balance. When land and space are limited, how to balance ecology protection and development. The second is sustainable versus beauty, the creation of deep forms. What is the relationship between sustainability and beauty? How to unite ecology and, and art? As, by the way, this image is an in Fall 1920, a debate between Ian McHugh, uh, who was a chair, who was a, a founder of a landscape architecture program at uh, Pennsylvania, Penn Design, and Carl Stanitz uh, and Foreman. Uh, they had the debate, there's a debate, hard debate in 2000, uh, uh, 1920, uh, 1992. So after graduating, I was recruited by SWA in Laguna Beach. California. There I was able to work with Richard Law on luxury properties, new urban development and the projects in booming Asian market. Life on the beach was pretty good. So I, I was able to design very luxury uh, uh, properties uh, at that time. But when but while I was designing luxury properties and imagining the grandeur of new cities, I found myself that the land at home was actually suffering. The old buildings were torn down, hills leveled, lakes and the wetlands filled and polluted, rivers channelized and dammed, squares and boulevards were built at a gargantuan size. It was the opposite of everything I have learned about good city and good landscape. Now, this was, uh, these were the, the images I took just uh, when I went back to China in uh, 1997. So that's the situation at the beginning, I'll show you this image. And it was a national wide challenges. How can we survive? It was an issue of survival. Not ornamental, not, not beautiful, it's survival. So meeting the challenges, I believe I could make a difference, but I had little idea of challenges that lay ahead of me. There was a first, I started the education. I started with education and I tried to create a new identity of myself and it's a profession. So, so I landed at the Peking University and was immediately joined by my lifelong fellow uh, Dihua, Li Dihua, together we started the landscape architectural program in the Department of Geography. We hoped to help an important new profession establish a foothold across a vast landscape. But we started a humble, uh, 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 only three students at that time. Now we have 200 graduates in school uh, with 300 plus graduated. But the people still tended to see me uh, simply as a gardener with no relationship to urban development, land and water management, flood control, or ecological uh, restoration. Actually, there are no people doing these things at that time. You know, flood control was uh, done by engineer, by flood, by hydro engineer. And there's nothing called ecological restoration. And water was managed basically as resources. 
no concern about water as an ecosystem, ecosystem. So I felt, I felt compelled to reclaim the importance of landscape architecture uh, itself and began describing it as the art of survival. And the landscape architecture to me seemed to seemed a way to recover the, the lost land of peach blossoms. A magical realm of peace, uh, 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 a sort of Shangri-La to a certain extent. Uh, so I have always thought of my village, Dongyu village, where I grew up. And I was inspired by Michael uh, E. McHugh, used the term survival. Uh, he said, don't ask us about your bloody flowers. We are going to talk to you about survival. Uh, it's, not, it's not just something make beautiful. It's about survival. So I launched a new magazine called the Landscape Architecture Frontier to promote this new identity. So I brought in good thinkers to lecture uh, uh, on this uh, 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 for over you know, 15 years. Uh, to have, we have 15 national landscape architecture conference to educate a new generation and it began to create a new uh, uh, kind of consensus. So this is a, uh, architects, landscape architects, urban planner, uh, 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 bring to China to bring to the school uh, to lecture. Uh, it's a national uh, uh, conference. And trying to reverse the damage and expand policy change. So we felt that immediate action had to be taken to reverse the damage. So we launched the concept called the inverse planning or called a negative planning, a reversal process, which prioritize what is not built, what should be protected. Now, this is exactly what uh, our students just asked the question in my first lecture, uh, how to do uh, the city. You know, at the beginning, you have to do, you have to reverse the process to build the unbuildable first, to plan the unbuildable first which means the natural, uh, natural infrastructure, nature as an infrastructure. So I also realized that the only way to reverse the damage caused by conventional planning procedure was to convince the decision makers to change the policy. So I kept writing, talking, and lecturing to decision makers from top authorities to, town, to township leaders. Now, this is some of my early books. Uh, and so the last one is, was translated already into uh, English letters to the mayors, to the leaders. So I delivered over 300 lectures to municipal decision makers and ministers. Now, this is one of my lectures in Guangzhou. You can see uh, all top leaders of the municipal government from secretary, party secretary, mayors to, to township leaders. This is another one uh, lecture I just gave it just a, a, a couple uh, weeks ago. To, you see who hurt it just last year. Uh, so this is a process of educating uh, our decision makers. I made a proposal to Prime Minister also Wen Jiabao just mentioned in the, in the last lecture and that eventually changes the policy of national uh, ecological uh, protection. So there's a second uh, to change the policy. Uh, the third thing I do is to raise uh, a, a big feet uh, revolution, a big foot revolution. Because I also realized that bad decisions were being made simply because of misguided mentality about the civilization and aesthetic uh, sensibilities. For thousands of years, a civilized urban elite worldwide has insisted on, uh, 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 on the privilege of defining civilization, beauty and good taste. So bound feet and deformed head and twisted bodies are only a few of such expressions of cultural practices that in trying to elevate sit 
sophisticates above rule of pumpkins, but have rejected nature's inherent principles of health, survival, and productivity. Now, those students may have uh, now that the China have about 2,000 years of food binding, you know, more than 1,000 years foot binding habitat or custom, you know, binding the, the girls, young girls of foot in order to pleasing the urban elite uh, to, to make them feel beautiful, uh, gentrification. Now that's kind of aesthetics, which really has a uh, 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 leading the urbanization, the buildings, the, the architecture, the landscape architecture, uh, taste. Uh, so for more thousand years, that's the Chinese uh, definition about what is beautiful, what is uh, rustic. Uh, the gentrified urban elite and the rustic uh, uh, rural uh, big feet girls. So little food urbanism and little food aesthetics. Today, landscaping and city building by far are the most visible and extensive manifestations of the folly of civilization and aesthetic standards defined from above. On one hand, the manicured little foot, gray infrastructure simply lacks resiliency and waste energy and material. In my lecture, last lecture you have I have shown you. And uh, on the other hand, urban elites with little food aesthetics trying to elevate city sophisticates above rural pumpkins have rejected nature's inherent goals of health and productivity. Now you have this, on my left side, you will see the productive rural uh, big feet landscape, rice paddies, uh, orchard, wetland, native grass, even fish, or even dogs. On my right side, you will see the gentrified urban landscape. The so irrigated lawn, ornamental flowers, and the golden fish now all become little feet or uh, 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 bounded, you know, with lose their productivity, lose their inherent uh, nature's. Uh, 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 health. Now, these kinds of little food, gray infrastructure and aesthetics are not only expensive, but also wasteful and unsustainable. Now, that's why we spend so much money, so much material and use unwisely and dumping them on the, in the water, building ugly buildings. Uh, you see, 60 to uh, 50 to 60 percent of materials being used in China in the past 40 years, every year, uh, 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 building those cities and uh, infrastructures. So I began advocating for a big foot revolution. This revolution began with questioning some basic values illustrated above, and it proved to be a revolution in design that mirrors an early revolution uh, uh, in the way Chinese thought about their own bodies and own culture. In the early 20th century, including the rejection of foot bending and the embrace, the embrace of the natural beauty, uh, the natural beauty and the human form. Uh, this we call the new cultural movement uh, launched at Peking University in the early 1920s. Uh, so I believe this happens at the three last balls of action. Again, come back to my first lecture planning. We need to plan a big fit, a big fit uh, ecological infrastructure across scale. That's the planning. Huh? The second is create nature-based engineering modules, uh, models inspired by the ancient wisdom, which mean create walking big feet. The third is how to make this big feet beautiful, eventually changes the policy, right? Because the policy, the, poli the policy maker is driven by their taste, by their, by their aesthetics. 
that's why, why that I think that we have to begin with the, the change of aesthetics. So that's connect to my first lecture, which I'm I'm not going to repeat uh, uh, here. So, but, uh, so this lecture is basically let you know how uh, 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 where my idea come from and who contributed to, to uh, what I uh, what I what I thought. And uh, 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 this is basically the background of my thinking of nature based solution uh, and my nutrients for for all what I have done. Uh, practice. Okay, Neomo? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, 